Wow, Nico and Nan, thank you so much for joining us today. And congratulations. Uh, P Valley is what I call an unexpected show, as in I had no idea what <laughs> I was getting into when I started it, but quickly was was very drawn in. Good, 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 good. That's what's up. You know, sometimes the best things are unexpected, you know, a surprise in every box. Absolutely. And your character, yeah. Uncle Clifford, is not like any other character I can really think of on television at the moment. So there's a lot I want to ask you about. Okay. Um, but on, fire I, away. All right. Well, let's start at the beginning then, because I know P Valley started originally as a play that was written by Katori Hall, who went on to yes. create the show. And you played Clifford in the original uh, reading of the play. I did. Awesome. I did. I, so, I originated this role. So. I'm blessed that's, in all of those ways. That's so fantastic. So I have to ask though, when you were doing the reading of the play, did you ever think I'm going to get this part when it becomes a TV series? No, <laughs> no, I, <laughs> not at all. I wasn't even thinking about that, to be honest with you. No. Um, when it came to me as a play, I was, uh, I was mesmerized not only by the description of Clifford, but I was really hyped and excited to have the opportunity to work with Katori because from what I knew of her work at the time, this is before me working with her, it, yeah. it, I, I was able to identify like with the, the, the heart and the soul in her, her work. Um, even when there weren't men or males, male bodies involved in the story, uh, sure. it was literally just about, I know those people that's what's up. That's something that I can really get with. So I was just really excited to sign on to, to just work and play. And also, to be honest, you know, I was in New York at the time. I was a New York working actor. And the climate was really different than what it is now in terms of what roles were available to Black men in, in uh, legit theater. That sure. legit meaning not, th not musical theater. Um, and also honestly with my type as a black gay man now uh, i of course when i trained i grew up with that rubric of in order to be an actor you have to play straight right you know um i never really i, I mean i signed up for that i guess because that was just the pedagogy back then um but i still never had any idea uh that it could be this glorious you know what i'm saying to yeah. to break those standards but so when i read the script i i, I for the first thing that i read wasn't a script to be honest with you it was literally about four or five pages uh, oh wow uh read that and but the description for uncle clifford was there because she was telling me about the idea of what a person that fully accepts their masculinity and femininity um would be like or what life for that person could be like um to access and and tap into it so sure. that was like a role of a lifetime and I was like oh this sounds like fun blah, 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 blah. so when it came to the whole tv situation I wasn't thinking about like I'm a shoe in I got it you know this is because I went through the whole audition process just like everyone else um for me it was more so about getting it true instead of getting it right you know I just wanted to get it authentically true that was my goal oh sure yeah totally and we should add at this point that Uncle Clifford is a genderqueer uh, African-American, uses the mm -hmm. pronoun she, and she runs a strip club in this tiny Texas town. Um, we are in Mississippi, but you got all of that right. Yeah, I saw Texas license plates, I swear. Okay. I love that you are getting that because that's where Autumn <laughs> Night is from. That's right. You're, you're doing right. You are okay. doing good stuff because the mystery of the show, you catch me. Autumn Night is from Texas with the flood, the Houston floods were happening. Right. And she migrated some way, you know, when she got off that bus in Chuckalisa. Chuckalisa okay. is a Choctaw for uh, hope. It means hope. I didn't yeah. know that. Now, I'm learning yeah. all kinds of things here. This is terrific. Come on, it's, it's much deeper. It's much deeper than what people think the, a, a strip show should be. Now, Clifford also has a very interesting sense of style. And so I'm curious, how closely do you work with wardrobe and makeup to develop the look of the character? How does that inform your performance? It is everything. We all work very closely together. I was able, I had amazing designers and it was like fun. Like 
opening up Pandora's box. Let's get in here and let's get gritty. I was very clear that every look, I kind of wanted to pay a little homage to the Black women in my life or that I, I, I looked up to, that Clifford would look up to. Sure. So whether it was my mom or whether it was like um, Mary J. Blige, oh, uh, yes. Mia Horn, um, if there was, there's something in there for Shaka, you know, um, and also like for my friend, Jeanne McAlpine, uh, there's a look that's in there for her. Just, she's a black girl from Detroit. So I wanted to bring in like the mixture of things of how, how Clifford could express. And we were very clear early on uh, that we needed to make sure that the expression was not it was different. There was a variance but from what drag culture is like yes, and, and, okay. and, and wardrobe and makeup styling and hair and what under Uncle Clifford's gender fluidity could look like. You know, yes. I definitely wanted to differentiate that. And I think sometimes people think you're in a small town, so you don't have much or you at a certain economic sta status, so you don't dress nicely. And right. that's not true. Just because you, you don't have a million dollars in the bank doesn't mean that you don't know how to go down to the, the Goodwill or go over to Dillard's and get you a good little suit and cut this stuff and, and then sew this part on and do all that kind of stuff. So it was all about expression. So yeah. the other thing that I have to say that I think a lot of readers are going to enjoy about the show is there's a whole lot of nudity going on in this show. Uh, there, okay. There's a lot of free range breasts and penises and all kinds of body parts. Um, it, it, and not in a titillating way, but in a just sort of matter of fact way that this is how these people live. Yeah. Um, I have to ask you as an actor, maybe because I'm such a prude myself, is it, is it uncomfortable going to work with that much nudity every day? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not uncomfortable. No? Um, no, I think it's different. It definitely is different and it's different than a lot of the other shows that I've been a part of for sure. But in that, uh, the nudity is not anything near gratuitous. Um, it is is very much so, it's art. Uh, I want to, this is a cultural reference, yeah. you know. Grew up in Detroit. If you didn't know, I'm black. And so... <laughs> I heard a rumor, yeah. You, you know, there, like, in back in the 60s and the 70s, there used to be this kind of art that would be in, in, the, in your basement or, like, it usually was in all, every Black person's home had this, whether it was a picture of Black Jesus or whether it was this picture of this beautiful chocolate ebony goddess. She had an afro and she would be lying down on the, some land somewhere and sometimes they, she would be with a panther or something like that, but it would yeah. be made out of wool or carpet or, like, a woven... A woven um, uh, painting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how the nudity is to me. Um, okay. It looks as though it's an appreciation of the black bodies. It's an appreciation of the full-figured bodies. It's appreciation of the curves. The um, I feel like the, you see breasts not only on the pole, but you see breasts when a woman is breastfeeding yes. her child. You know, so there is a normalization that happens and a destigmatization that's going on, I think that happens in American culture. We can be very, as you said, prudish or whatever, you know, like, oh my yeah. God, a body, you know, but it, it's an equal opportunity place where the male body is appreciated just as much as the female body. And I think that that was important to Katori and for us as actors, we had this, we, we had an epiphany when we shot the pilot presentation for Stars. We were sitting around and we, we realized like we were on a break uh, mm -hmm. coming from the club. Sure. And I said, y'all, we really doing it. They were like, yeah, 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 we are, oh my God, oh my gosh. But we were up on this stage with the, our floss. We had these revealing costumes. We had to, we, we decided right then and there that we are too vulnerable. We're too exposed, okay. naked, you yeah. know? That meaning, if we are going to do this physically, we have to do that emotionally. So we had made a pact then, literally as a group that, we are always going to be real with each other. We are going to be clear. We are going to keep each other safe. And the production, they, they caught on the wave of that. They were always there, supportive. We had uh, intimacy coordinators. We had the directors, all female directors. They were yeah. all very, very clear. Everything is written out, what's going to happen. So you knew that beforehand. There was no, no trickery, no madness. It was yeah. all good. So you were able to be just free 
to let the story come through and to be of service for the character. That's fantastic. I, I yeah. like that you mentioned the directors there. The, the show does have all female directors this season, mm -hmm. including uh, episode two, one of my favorite directors, Kim Pierce, uh, yeah. of Voice of Cry and Carrie Faye. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I bring her up in part because Kim is someone who's openly genderqueer herself. Yeah. And so I'm wondering when you are playing a genderqueer character and you're working with a genderqueer director, how does that mm -hmm. affect the dialogue between the two of you, first of all, and does that influence your choices as an actor? It doesn't influence my choices as an actor because my no. choices as an actor are rooted in the words. Okay. They're rooted in the script. Um, um, but working with Kim was everything that you didn't have to say. We didn't have, there were, there were the things that you sometimes have to explain to someone who's outside of the LGBT okay. community. Yes. I didn't have to do. That's right. I did not have to do that. So um, if in a scenario when I'm in my car, Let's just say I'm in my car and scene two, there's a scene that happens in my car. Yeah. And in there, I, I said to Kim, I was like, it's just one of those things that's like, you know, mm, I, I literally said that sound, that face, and she was like, <laughs> got it. That's right, yeah, because it's this, 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 you know, and so it, yeah. it gave her the jump to get on. So it was the unsaid, the, the, the things that queer people and, and gender fluid people and members of the LGBT community, the things that you know and have felt on a visceral level, yeah. she already connected to. So in terms of my acting choices, if anything, it allowed me as Uncle Clifford to relax more 